Okay, well, we know that our Lord is the Lord of hosts. He's the general. So why would we try and go in front of him? Why would we try and go ahead of, of what he's talking to us about? And right now he's talking to us about preparing for what's coming. Tim was talking to me about, um, he felt from the Lord, about these Anderson shelters. You're during the war, they built the Anderson shelters. And the folk used to say, I don't know what we've got these for, they'd be useless, you know, all the, and laughing at them. And then when the bombs started to fall, they were running in them quick shot, crowded together, crowded together. And Mrs. Such a Body from down the road who rubbed you up the wrong way and you couldn't stand her, was in, in the Anderson shelter ne next to you every night. And it was tall curling at first. But by the end of the war, you were the best of pals. But the Anderson shelters are going to... It, it's an analogy for the house fellowships that will eventually, hopefully, the Lord will gather together. And it's just being practical like anything else. For instance, if I say to the people, um, do we have your permission to keep a register with your name, address and your email on your phone number? I won't be giving that out. But if I have somebody from Nottingham who meet together, two or three, and another person asks me in Nottingham, do I know anybody that they could join with? I would give them the email. I would give them the emails. Then they could talk on the email. And then maybe after a week or two, you could meet in the coffee shop and you could chat together or in the park or whatever. You know what I'm saying to you? Mm -hmm. And little by little, you can come together when you think, oh, they are all right. They're on the same. Because you can't be out of church for many, 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 many years and then come straight back into a house group. Yeah. It won't work, folks. Yeah. And you'll fall out and you'll be back to square one, maybe even worse. So you need to use common sense this way. So what I'm saying is if we do have any kind of a register, that's how it would work. And that's the advice we would give. Don't come together till you're sure you know that you can get on with one another. Because if it falls apart... Like we said, we're back to square one. And we do not have the time to waste. We do not. Tim's right. There's a lot of bad stuff coming. A lot of bad stuff. And we need to be ready. We really need to be ready. And the church is still asleep. You know, Song of Solomon, the bride's on the bed. She's fast asleep. I'm telling you, the church, we're, we're just going to get... It's going to shock us who are, who are aware of these things Never mind those who are not aware of them. It's going to be a bombshell to them. And we don't know how much time you've got left. Now, I'm not trying to frighten you in any way, but you, you've seen what's gone on in Israel in, on October the 7th. God always dealt with the enemy, with Israel, always dealt with Israel by sending the enemy to overrun them or capture them. Is that not so? Yeah. yeah. Nothing's changed. Nothing's new under the sun. You've all these people coming into all these countries of the same ilk, the same mind. You've seen this on the videos. They're openly saying in the streets what they're going to do. And we were so shocked and heartbroken about what we saw in Israel. We didn't think such a thing would ever happen. Bearing in mind the youngsters were there at the Nova Festival and they were dancing and singing and worshipping around Shiva and Buddha. And it was just like the golden calf, wasn't it? And God did exactly the same kind of thing. He dealt with the people. I know that's hard. It sounds harsh, I know. But God is a righteous judge and he has warned them throughout history. If you turn away from me, this is what will happen. Tim talked about slavery. 
we can't all fit in prison if they're going to go for the Christians. There is millions of us. I don't know if there's millions in the UK, but there's millions of us around the world. We can't all fit in the prisons. So how many times have we said that there could be labour camps, concentration camps, these kind of camps? I think some of them are already there. People in America tell us they are. They've seen them. It's like slave labour, like the gulag, like they did in Siberia. They sent all the Jews to the gulag and all the political prisoners. And some of them lived and died there. And we know from Hebrews, it's not going to be easy for the body in the last days. What makes us think, because we're in the West, that it's not going to come to us? Look at the Christians in Nigeria now. Uh, 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 and in Iran. Now, there's something I want to talk to you about the Christians in Iran. Um, I was watching um, a video that one of the American uh, film people had done. He's a believer and he's a Messianic Jew. And he'd gone into Iran and he had filmed the underground church secretly. And uh, they, he had spoken with them, if I can find it. And they had talked to him about the church in, in Iran and the church in the West. And I'm going to tell you now what their idea and reasonable service is unto the Lord as a believer. These are young men and women. There are older ones, but a lot of them are young. And they are brand new babies in Christ. They are born again. And they're filled with the Spirit. And that Spirit, yes, does give them boldness. And they, um, Dalton called this uh, video, The Sheep Amongst the Wolves. That's what he said in Iran. They are the sheep amongst the wolves. And that's what we'll all be around the world as Christians soon. Once saved, he said, they become one of the most, if not the most, aggressive pro-Israel yeah. believers who will do anything for the Lord. Now, this is a land where they're very brutal with the women and they oppress the women. Yet it's, it's the women that, in many cases, that are running the Bible groups. They submit to husbands Fair enough, but it's the women that's running the Bible groups. And like the missionaries, they're running the Bible groups, they're building up the young men, and then these young men can come and take over as pastors in the groups. And this is, this is what they said. They said, this is the blueprint for a growing church. These are new believers. We're here, some of us have been here saved 55 years or more, yeah? And this is the blueprint for a, a baby in Christ from Iran because of what they're in, what they're suffering and what the Holy Spirit has em empowered them and, and empowered them with. They said, uh, this is the blueprint. No property, no buildings, no denominations, no bank accounts, no assets, no centralised leadership, but just the church is just just a body. Just, just a body that knows about suffering and martyrdom. Now listen to this. We disciples know, this was the ladies, that we will be raped, October 7th, beaten, same, killed or tortured, or both. But, they, they all said with one accord, we are prepared to offer our bodies as a li living, reasonable sacrifice for Jesus through these things. Uh, can you imagine if I preach that to the church in the West? The Lord has said this, or this is what you have to do now. Can you imagine? But this is their reasonable service. This is what they're going through as believers for the Lord. And they see it as nothing because Christ is everything. And what they're saying is, 
He has given us his all. It's the least we can give to him. And their girl said, we just give our bodies as dead bodies. But our mind is in Christ and with the Lord when it's happening. I think that is such an amazing lesson and testimony to us. And we think we know it all. And here are babes in Christ who can stand in the midst of this persecution and cope with that and believe it's their reasonable service. And they don't need buildings, money, executive pastors, supreme leaders, whatever you like to call the church people these days. They don't need church bank accounts. They don't need this. They don't need that. It's just like... Acts of the Apostles, New Testament Christians, isn't it? Now, do we serve the same Lord? So why do we think it's not going to happen here or that God can't do that for us? Why do we think that? Because really, the test of the matter is, if we believed it, we'd be, in, we'd be doing it. I mean, like the boldness and going out with the gospel and, and, and throwing away everything we don't need. But this is the place God will bring us to. I'm not saying about the rape and the torture and all of that. I'm saying he's bringing us to a place of having nothing and not wanting anything and thinking that the only thing that matters is Jesus Christ and his will for our life. We need to turn our will over to Christ because we need to do the will of the Lord, not our own. But you see, we've been so spoiled, haven't we, in the West? And even finding fellowship in small house groups and coming together and doing small things like that, it will be mourning and groaning and complaining. We will. We will we'll be just like the Israelites. We will be moaning and groaning, complaining. Did you hear what she said? He rubbed me up it, the wrong way. I, I, I had a right cob on with him. I'm telling you, it was, a, it was a nuisance. I'm not coming next week if she comes. <laughs> I'm going to start a group of my own. I'm not putting up with that. It's true. It's what we do as human beings, isn't it? And we need to be delivered of all this. Now, if we've been out of church for a long time, um, we are, it's like a bachelor who comes to get married at 70 or 80. Yeah. Pastor was giving that example last night, wasn't he? You know, you, you've had your own way for 70 years and suddenly you're married and you think, oh, what have I done? <laughs> or was it, it might have been Lance Lambert that gave the, I forget. But anyway, I, it, it clicked. I thought, yeah, it's true. It's true. If we do it now in a body that we're in with, that we love one another as much as we're able to. We used to have an, a Jewish friend, Alan Sachs. And Alan is a Messianic Jew and he used to say, you're told to love one another. You don't have to like them. <laughs> And you know, that's always stuck with us. You're told to love one another. You don't have to like them. So there are times when you zip it and you, you do the right thing. And eventually, if you keep doing that, the Holy Spirit will change you from inside out. And this is what we're heading towards. This is, this is where we're going. So I absolutely find that the... Church in Iran has a great deal to teach us, those, those young babes in Christ. They could te it's the same with the Chinese underground church, the same, you know. And actually, we did find that when we went in 1990, when the Iron Gates opened and we went into Belarus and Ukraine. We found that, that we, a lot of Western preachers would come in and it, it was like, I'm, I'm the great I am, I know everything. I've been saved 30 years, you know. I'm going to teach these people because uh, they don't know anything. You know, they know nothing. 
and I know it all. This kind of, we, we saw it. Arrogance. It is arrogance. And you know what? Those quiet, simple people had already been in an underground church meeting in the woods in winter. We've been there when they baptised them, 20 below freezing, even broke the ice, Peter. Yeah, where are you? They've even broke the ice to baptise them. Oh, can you see the Western Church? Right, church, we're going down to the lake. There's only an inch of ice on, but we'll break through it. We'll baptise you in your thin white robes. Not a murmur from them. They taught us far more than what we could teach them. The only new thing we could teach them was the understanding about Israel and the church and the whole thing. Because they, they knew what it was like to be an underground church. And we learned the lessons from history. We were talking the other day when the exodus, second exodus with the Jews come and it must be very near now. You know, a lot of people say, I don't think it's going to happen. It might be after we've been raptured or whatever, I don't know. Whenever that will be, if we're still alive, some of us. But my answer to that is, look, it's in the word of God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, it's all there, second exodus. You know, this last exodus back to Israel. And that the Gentiles have got to help them. The forces of the Gentiles, that means the wealth. It doesn't only mean money, it means experience. Your car, your spur bed, the food on your table to give them. It, it means all of that as well as your money. But it's in the word of God. So it has to be for the body. Because the world doesn't read the word of God, does it? So it has to be for the body. It has to be for the bride. Let's, let's perm it down. Never mind. Because a lot of the body now will be on a wide road. Like Tim said, they'll, they'll be attached to things and they'll be back on that ship or whatever. They will be, we will be purred down to a Gideon's army. Because God will have the glory in this exodus, not us. But the thing is, it's for the bride because it, the world doesn't read the scriptures. Therefore, it's got to be when we're here to do it. Now, most of us who know about the second exodus are getting on in age. The young ones don't know about it. So either the Lord is going to lift us up on eagles' wings and we're going to be like, um, you know, Methuselah with muscles under nod and, you know, muscle and do the work or it's going to happen soon. We see the hatred around the world now. We see the, the anti-Semitism. The Lord said this is the, this, the Lord said he'd sent that delusion around the world. Do you remember that all of a sudden after April the 7th, all of a sudden, all the nations began to hate Israel and loved Hamas. Oh, they only knew Hamas would shoot the lot of them. I'm telling you, they've no idea. Stupid young people, some of them. And I've nothing against young people. But the world began to hate in a massive way, didn't it? And, and I said, Lord, why? What? There's always been anti-Semitism, Lord, but why? Why so much like this? And the Lord said, I've sent a strong delusion that, so that they'll hate my people because it has, they have to fulfil the word I've spoken, which was, all nations will come against Israel. So in order for all nations to come against Israel, they have to hate Israel. And it's building now. So, we're, you know, we're running out of time, folks. Now, we don't know if they'll go for the Christians first and then the Jews or the Jews and Christians. We don't know. But either way, both of those peoples are going to be in the same boat. Which is another reason why we have to stand with Israel. In all our intercessions, we have to stand with Israel. I'm telling you, if we don't do the right thing by the Jews we will be in serious trouble with the Lord. We will. 
And even if you can't take many in, in your home or hide them or, or transport them from A to B, wherever, to get them on to the Jewish agency on the planes or on the ships, if God provides, we're in planning stage of that in the Ukraine. And we're talking about rivers. And that's all I'm going to say to you. I'm not going to tell you anything else. Because what we don't know, we can't tell, can we? But we're dealing with rivers and small boats because we don't know people with big ships. God might bring them eventually, but right now we don't know them. So our plans will be small boats down rivers, certain rivers which we've planned. Taking them to ports, if it's a ship, and to airports from the from the river in, in trucks to the airport for the Jewish agency to, to take them home. Either way, we have to be sure that the body of Christ, even though we'll be in homes and not have a lot then, I think that's because God will have all the greater glory because we'll have little and he'll, he'll bring it all. But we have to have a genuine heart to to do it okay so all this is building towards us bringing back into the fellowship the holy spirit first of all for boldness for the gospel because that is a command that we were given and it's not been changed we can't lay it down do what you can when you can speak where you can wherever you can so they laugh at you so they call you names, big deal. Look what they're, they're suffering in Iran for it. We've got to start and get this mentality of, oh, I can't say anything, and I might lose my job and all the rest of it. Look, the, Tim showed you this morning that when you stand with the Lord's word, the Lord will stand with you. If you lose your job and you need a job, God will find you a job. Or he'll provide for you in some way. We have to build this trust of walking forward with the Lord. So the first thing really for the small groups when we start to look at coming together is that before that we all need to privately be in the closet, privately dealing with our own lives. Never mind what's going on anywhere else. Never mind what ministry is doing what, unless you're involved with these things. Be for yourself in the closet, just you and the Lord. Let's get our lives dealt with first. And then when we come together, we will start to see great discernment amongst us, prophecies, words of knowledge. And we're going to need words of knowledge. We're going to need words of knowledge. Remember in the, in the Old Testament where um, the prophet knew what was said in the enemy's camp. And, was, and, a, and as such, the army was able to, the Jewish army was able to overcome the, their enemy. These things have gone on in the past and we have been witness to some of them, yes. Some of us here have as well. But they will be vital for the future. We will need to know ahead of time what the enemy is doing or saying or about to bring forward. We will need to know so that we can pray for the host of heaven to stand around us. You remember um, Elisha and his, and his uh, assistant Gehazi? And Elisha just prayed, Lord, open his eyes. Because he saw all the army and he thought, oh, crumbs, we've had it, that's it. We've no chance now. And he just said to the Lord, Lord, open his eyes. And he saw the whole host of heaven encamped around him. Why do we think that we, we don't serve the same God? Why do we think that that's not going to happen to us? Why do we think these things when the word of God clearly tells us that it will happen? We will see these things before he takes us, whether he comes for us or we go via the grave. So we're moving into these uh, situations where, first of all, I believe the Lord wants us to deal with ourselves first. 
<laughs> never mind, let's put everything right round here. We'll sort this fellowship out. We'll do this. We'll do this ministry. Could do with that and all the rest. Forget all this. Because all these things are going to go soon. They're going to go. If the money goes, and, and that's wobbling in certain parts, but if the money goes, then just about everything goes, doesn't it? So we need to learn in the prayer closet how to pray in what you need. We spent 20 years in Little Car doing that. We had to pray in every single thing we needed down to the smallest thing and the biggest thing. And God always gave it us. And the fruit of that work now is now in the army, in, as, as pastors, as, min, as ministers, Sunday school teachers, missionaries. It's all there. God gave us everything. He really built our trust in him up to a high standard because every single thing we needed, we prayed it in. That's how you're going to have to do it. You can forget your bank account or don't care how rich you are. It won't, it won't be nothing. It'll be nothing. It, it's all going to go. Only the Lord can provide for you. And you need to know him. Remember what he said? Depart from me, I never knew you. You only know the Lord in the prayer closet. You do. And in his word. Those two things will build your character to be a, a, a real soldier on the battlefield. And you can't go out on that battlefield till you've done that work within your own self. And the Holy Spirit will be working away. That might take us best part of a year before we probably take much longer. We're never going to be pure. But it says the bride gets herself ready. This is what we're doing now. We're beginning to get ourselves ready because we know what's coming. We are not in a position at the moment uh, to wear the bridal dress, really. We've not put it on yet, not at all. Uh, and the gifts that our king has left us, these spiritual gifts, you know, in the Old Testament, the, the, the groom, being a king, would leave great gifts that the worldly people didn't have. It's a similarity with the scripture. God has given us gifts that the world has not got. We've not put them on yet and we've not used them yet. But we're taking the first steps to do that. We're saying to the Lord, over these next few weeks, you need to be saying to the Lord, I know that I've got to do it, Lord. I'm ready, but I find, I find it's hard. I don't, I don't know how to do it. Well, just... Just kneel or sit before him in prayer in a quiet time. Just let him come to you. I think that's the biggest fear with most people. They're sat quiet and they have this fear that the Holy Spirit's going to come and completely take them over and they'll have no control. Now, it's not like that. He does take you over. He controls. But it's, the, it's God it's not some dictator that's taking you over and making you do terrible things. It's another realm altogether, and I think a lot in the body are afraid of that, you know. I do. <coughs> They'll sit for so long, and then it'll be, you know, it's like they're afraid to, to be... <laughs> Whatever, we've got to do it. We've got to have the Holy Spirit in our life, and that is only the first step. And... In the meantime, we start to gather together and make these um, units of fellowships around the country. But we don't go running into that just yet. Please, let's all of us get ourselves right with God, please. Now, I want to really encourage you. I want to show you the pictures from Israel. And I want to tell you the miracles that God is doing. Simply so that you know that God is not a compartmental God at all. God is a God of love and all his people 
are treated the same. He is without partiality. He is impartial. And he, what he does for one people, he will do for another. We are his bride and these people he has the covenant with. See all the bags ready for going out. Have you ever seen an army do that before? Before battle? You'll never see it. Only in Israel with the Spirit of the Lord. These are unsaved men. But many are orthodox and they do love the Lord. They understand God. Just don't know Jesus. But they're beginning to. Now, before we show the next one, Isaac, I just want to say to you, they're writing scriptures on the tanks before they go into battle. They are putting the prayer shawls on because they don't, this is what God told them to do, so they're doing it. They're being obedient to the Lord, you know. Don't judge them, oh, Judaism, these are unsaved. But they love the Lord, many of them. They, let me tell you, the Orthodox read that we're not talking about the ultra Orthodox, that's a cult. They're wicked. But the Orthodox Jews read their Bible, those who follow the Lord, six hours every day. You tell me. You tell me what believer reads six hours a day every day. Come on. They know God, they just don't know Jesus. They understand that God has a spirit and they call him Ruach HaKodesh, which is spirit of the Lord or breath of the Lord. Okay. Now, since these miracles that I'll share with you, they are absolutely convinced that their God is going out before them and their prayer before every battle, we've heard it, their prayer if you don't go out before us, Lord, we will not go to battle. That's biblical. If you don't go with us, we will not win. But if you go, we will have victory. Unsaved men pray in such a prayer. This is the spirit of the Lord. It's beginning in them. Okay, Isaac. Have we got another one? Just come back from battle and they won. Hallelujah. We do have another one, that last one, um, because we've been sending money for their uh, equipment. They have turned to the Christians and they said to us, we consider you like uh, Ruth. You remember Ruth who went with Naomi, that's Israel. <coughs> Orpha left halfway along, that's the false church. And we consider you like Ruth to us. And we would call you, what did he call us? Uh, Messianic Zionists. <laughs> I said, is that what you would call me? He said, yeah. Uh, and I have said to them, I am a disciple of Yeshua. Because I don't say Christian anymore because it's something banded about and it doesn't mean what it used to mean. And any Tom, Dick and Harry can call themselves a Christian these days. 
I'm not a Christian. I am a disciple of Yeshua. This they understand. This they understand. And these uh, soldiers, they're, um, they're in the containers they had outside of the camp. They had all their winter wear in, their jackets, their boots, the pants, everything, ready for going up on the Golan, which they've just come back from. And a missile from Hamas hit it. Any other time, they miss, don't they? They never get it right. And this time, boom, it hit the containers. It, everything went up. The jeeps went up. Everything went up. No equipment. Now, understand the situation. The government have pulled out folk from the north and the south so that they're safe in the middle of the land. They are paying for them. Yes, Christian ministries and fellowship, messianic fellowships are helping with food and things and clothes, but the government are paying for them to be in hotels and all of this. So a lot of money coming out of the government. And normally they would just reorder all those things. But what they said to the soldiers was, which I thought was terrible, they said, well, ask your parents if they'll buy the things for you or you try and buy them. First of all, they don't get a salary in the Israeli army. They only get spends. They don't get a salary. And most of all, most of the parents have been pulled out, so they're not working. They're not, they're not near their homes. There's no jobs, nothing. This is now seven or eight months. So they couldn't buy those things. And so they told us through Chris because you know most of us most of you that know us we work with christian friends of israel jerusalem and have done for 35 years alongside them and they said they turned to the christians because they said you've always helped us and we have always helped the army we've done what we can for them over the years and we've planted seeds when we've gone because we don't waste the journey and so they said would, would you be kind enough to ask Christians if they would help us? And we said, yeah, gladly. Now, we are not a big ministry, Peter and I, ministry, you know. Uh, and so we put out a newsletter and we let friends know and we asked if they would give. And we were able to buy, along with Christian Friends of Israel, not just us, uh, the, the winter jackets that they needed the man in the shop was so impressed that Christians had given all this money to buy these jackets. We're talking 750 in the brigade. And uh, I, think we, I think there was 450 that needed them. Some of them had them, about 100, 450. He was so impressed that Christians would do this for Jews that he gave the trousers free. So we had the whole suit. And since then, we've been able to buy... Um, Thermal necklets, I don't know what they're for, but anyway, that's what they call them. And we've just bought the helmets, and that's what they were doing. They were saying thank you for those helmets. Now, there are many believers in, in the different brigades in the Army and the Air Force and the Navy, but mainly Army, mainly Army, because God wants to save the Army because they, they lose most men, don't they, as, a, as an Army? And these are frontline Gulani soldiers. And I'm telling you, things are happening. Things are happening. Now, if we see God do this all the time in Israel or in Ukraine. He's doing it with us, with the army in Ukraine. I can tell you another stories there. The testimonies are amazing. Raising from the dead. And I'm telling you, it's been documented by the doctors. The man was dead. Anyway, that's another story. But if he's doing it with Israel, he can do it with us. We're already saved. They're in process of being saved. So I want to encourage you now, listen, listen to, some, to some of these. I'm not, I can't tell you all because of time. What time are we? Right. Oh, we're okay, yeah. Um, I want you to know the miracles because they are astounding. And... When you listen to them, just let it sink in. If he can do that for them, he can do it for us in whatever situations we are. All right, we'll start. Number one, uh, this is by word of mouth from the soldiers that were involved in the miracles and it happened to. So these are not second-hand stories and these are not made up, added bits on. This is straight from the soldiers. Sharon interviewed all the soldiers. 
My unit was called in on Shabbat morning. Weapons had been handed to us. We had never shot them before because the reservists, all the reservists had called, they practice on some of these and, and then in an emergency, if there's a pile of guns on the base in that area, they just grab what they can. If, if they're not near their own base, which on October the 7th, everybody wasn't expecting it. So, so we'd never shot these guns before. We'd no idea if they worked. And that's how we went into combat on October the 7th, not knowing if their guns worked, bless them. We were immediately engaged by terrorists. My rifle worked perfectly, firing every shot, hitting what I was aiming at, not a single, je not a single jam. Every terrorist I aimed at, I killed. I praised God. I, he said, I thanked Hashem, the Lord, for giving me a rifle that worked when many do not. Then we switched to another battalion. They moved them somewhere else. Uh, and after resting, we went to the range to practice, right? Immediately, the rifle I was using on the range that I'd just used to kill all them terrorists jammed. And again, and again, and again. I took it to the arms sergeant and showed it him. And he, he had a look at it and he took parts out. He said, son, this is a broken rifle. He said, it can't be broken. I've just killed seven terrorists with it. It was working. It never jammed once. Son, it's broken. It can't have killed anybody. You couldn't. So he handed it back to him. And the young man tried it. And it jammed. <laughs> Do you see? In the day of battle, it did not jam. When he needed it to, because he'd have been dead first time, had it jammed. But in the moment of battle, it worked because God was doing it. But on the rifle range, when he didn't need it, it didn't work. And lo and behold, he even tested it after the army sergeant, the, the arms sergeant had had it and it truly, it didn't work. <laughs> So he said, I thanked Hashem for saving my life because I know who saved me that day. These are unsaved soldiers. Next one. An IDF commander tells of an elite unit sent to enter into Gaza at night. The city was dark and it was a virtual minefield. There was no one around. Just as this platoon of Israeli soldiers entered the empty block, knowing that there could be uh, explosives laid all over the place in our path. We thought, which house do we go in, which is, could be, you know, mined, or anything like that, um, or, or the basements that we have to, have to enter. It was a life or death mission. The commander had not slept for close on 36 hours. He could barely see in front of him. They entered into the blackness of the night, every hand on the shoulder in front of them, you know, like that, because it was dark with the, front, with the commander at the front leading them. And they went into the house, quietly walking, small steps, hand on, on shoulder like that. All of a sudden, the commander saw a white dove flying off the roof of a building and the dove flew right down in front of the commander. We all saw it. The dove landed in mid-air in front of his face. So it's here, in mid-air, in front of his face. And it hovers in the air. And it, he's looking at the bird. And he knows he's not slept. And he thinks, I must be imagining this. But it continues to float in air, in mid-air like this, in front of him, looking at him. So he leans forward and he was about to touch the bird. And the soldier behind him pulled him back. Automatic instinct, isn't it, for the soldier to do that for his commander? Pulled him back because you don't know. And then when he's, he pulled him back and then he, he, looked, he looked again and the do dove wasn't hovering. It had landed on a very thin trip wire going all across the street. One more step and the entire block of houses half the street would have blown up and killed the whole brigade. 
the dove looked back at the commander and flew off. Who was the dove? Holy Spirit. Of course it was. Next one. This soldier told this about his brother. He said, my brother's in the Gulani Brigade, which is the one we were interviewing. He has to go in the tunnels. The soldiers had to enter a house to get to a tunnel, which was underground in one of the rooms. In the IDF, the officers go in first and then we follow, as our ancestors did in the Bible. You know, follow me. This is what Christ says to us, follow me. The unit goes in, 25 soldiers, and the others stayed behind and surrounded the house. The soldier with the radio calls the commanding officer after a little while to find out if they're going to stay in the tunnel and keep searching or come out. No answer. The soldier outside guarding uh, walked into the house uh, to see what was going on because there's no answer from the commander. Standing at the entrance to the door where the entrance to the tunnel was, was a rabbi, stood there with a long black beard and a black coat, just standing there. And the sergeant said to him, what do you think you're doing in this house? What are you doing here? Do you not know this is dangerous? He said, the soldier said, I think he was a... Sadik, the righteous being, he said. You must get out of the house now, said the rabbi in Hebrew. <laughs> he said, he spoke in Hebrew. You must get out of the house now. If you don't get out, there will be many widows and orphans. You must leave now. The soldier answered him saying, we cannot leave. We, we have to go into the tunnel to find our brothers. He said, you must leave. They replied, we are not leaving without our commander. At that moment, up pops the commander with the rest of the soldiers. He comes out of the tunnel with the soldiers and the rabbi is blocking the door to the tunnel when they'd moved out. And he puts his hand out to block them from entering. You can't... He says, you can't go in there, you can't, you don't, don't enter into there. So he's, he's, blocking, he's blocking the door. And one soldier reached forward to push the rabbi out of the way because they hadn't finished investigating the rooms. So he, he went like that to push him out of the way and his hand went right through him. All the soldiers were there, they saw it. The commander was there, they saw it. His hand, he said his hand went right through him. There was nothing there. He said, we all looked at one another and thought, what are we watching here? Who is this? He said, we were in shock. <laughs> I'm not surprised. We were in shock. The commanding officer then also comes round by the rabbi. And the rabbi is still standing there. And he says, rabbi, you have no business being here. Get out. And the rabbi says to him, no, you must get out and get out now. And he said, when he said, you must get out now, the now was such authority. He said, it rung in our ears, the now. You must get out now, he said. And he said, it, it, you know, it, it, it rung in our ears, the, the authority. He said, and as he said that, as he said that word... And we heard that sound. He said, fire came out of his mouth. In Revelation, fire comes out of Jesus' mouth to kill his enemies. Is that not so? Fire came out of his mouth. He said, it totally freaked us all. That was it. We all ran out as fast as we could. And he's shouting after us, get out, get out, get out. He said, we took 20 steps, and to run 20 steps out of the house and it blew sky high we would have all gone with it. And he was right, we would have had widows and orphans. He said, but who did we see? He said, do you think, he's asking the question of, the, of Sharon, uh, who, who do you think we saw? Was it a, a, a Malak, an angel? And I said to Sharon, no, I think that was Christ in, the, in a Christophany. I, I don't know, but I think it was anyway. That's what I think. 
Another one, there were 18 Israeli soldiers in a house ready to rest for the night, empty house. Nine were religious, so they asked another soldier to pray with them. You know they need 10 for a minyan, for a prayer group. They need 10, as required by prayer. He said, I will, but first I need to go to the bathroom. So off he trots to the bathroom. After a period of time, he didn't come back. And the, the boys said, where, where is he? And said, he's still in the bathroom. And it must have been a while because they all trooped to the bathroom, the other nine. They went to the bathroom and when they got to the door, they could hear this moaning and groaning. And they smashed the door down and they saw an Arab who'd come up from one of the uh, tunnels trying to pull the other soldier down. And he was fighting for his life to stay, you know, without being pulled down into the... Um, uh, to, into the tunnel underneath the bathroom floor so they obviously they ran and they grabbed the soldier and then one of them shot the terrorist um, now the fact of the matter there was God allowed that to happen he made him go to the bathroom because if he hadn't gone to the bathroom he wouldn't have known the tunnel was there and there was terrorists in and they were sleeping there for the night and they all would have been murdered so he, they came back and they said again something is going on here the, our God is going before us and then this is another amazing one it was an Israeli general related this story we had 800 students who were learning Torah in the learning centre. And these, they, they found this out because they captured these Arab terrorists. So they've already captured the Arab terrorists and now I'm telling you what comes of that. Um, so they're all in the learning centre, 800 of them, young boys. The Arab terrorists had learned that the student's schedule was such and such and so... They were planning to set it. Uh, they were planning to blow it up with all eight hundred students in it. But after they captured the terrorists, they were interrogating him. This general was interrogating him, and this is the story that came out. He said uh, to the terrorists, "Why did you not attack the yeshiva? Because nothing happened to the yeshiva. Why did you not attack the yeshiva?" And, and one of the Arabs said to him, well, don't be stupid, we didn't need to. He said, why didn't you need to? He said, it was on fire, it was burning, we saw it. We could smell the smoke, we could feel the heat. We thought one of our missiles has got it and burnt a lot of them so we can go to the next job. <laughs> this is the terrorists. And, and the general said to him, there was no smoke, there was no fire. It's not burnt down. Well, the other Arab apparently jumped in then and said, oh, but there was. We saw it. We could smell the smoke and we felt the heat. And that's why we went to the next uh, job. Uh, uh, but while they were on the way there, they got, they got captured. And the general said, I can take you there and show you. There's nothing touched that building. It's not, it wasn't burnt. Uh, all eight, 800 yeshiva students were perfectly safe. And the Arabs still wouldn't believe him. He said, but the general said, well, I saw it with my own eyes, so I know. So isn't that amazing? The Lord had caused them to see that, like he can blind the eyes of those that you don't want them to see anything. You know, there's a, another soldier that we know. He, he, he never prays and he's not religious, but he was going out to battle. He was one of the group, uh, I think, from the Galanis. And just at that moment, he thought, I'll take a book of Psalms with me. Who do you think plonked that in his head? Yeah, of course it's the Lord. He doesn't ne normally have a book of psalms on him he doesn't normally pray but he just decided i'll have a anyway he'd got something in his pocket here a radio or something so he put it in the left pocket right over the heart and guess where when he got shot the bullet went <laughs> boom right in the book of psalms and saved his life now he also said i am telling you that hashem saved me that day i know he did so this young man is now reading 
you know, the Psalms. So let's hope that the Lord really speaks to him, you know, uh, in, in such a way that he comes to faith. And one, one, one last one I'll, I'll share with you. Um, this soldier's name is Mikhail Ben Yosef. And um, he was in a group and the IDF soldiers were advancing and they'd already passed a tunnel which they hadn't seen. They didn't discover it. And they carried on walking a little way just further on. And then they stopped walking. They decided they would have a rest. And Michael took the opportunity to pray. He put his prayer shawl on and he walked a, a, a back a little way. And he, was, he just turned this way because they have to face towards Jerusalem. That's the law. Um, and it was at that point that Machiel saw a terrorist exit this tunnel that they'd missed and began to advance on them. Uh, and he had, it wasn't just a rifle. I don't know how big an RPG is and I don't know if it was one, but it was something you like heavy that you carry. Them. <laughs> Boom, yeah, something that would have finished a lot of them anyway. And he, he went to fire it and it jammed because it, it, it would have been dead if he'd have fired it. But... As, as he went to fire it, Michael shouted to the soldiers who'd sat down. Some of them were lying down, but of course they all have their guns with them. He'd put his gun down because he was going to pray. Normally they, they would have their guns with them, else he probably would have shot the terrorists. But this thing jammed and so the soldiers, he shouted to the platoon and a firefight ensued and the terrorist was killed. And they dropped a, gr a grenade down the tunnel to ensure there was no more terrorists. And then they had a big discussion about the incident. And Michael said, it was the Lord because I, I was obedient to go and pray. You know? And even in the October 7th situation, we know of a, um, a, a Jewish messianic uh, family who were in uh, Nahal Oz, I think. It was. Anyway, they were in the house and they heard the terrorists outside. It was early morning. They looked out the window and they, they heard them. Obviously, they were speaking in Arabic and um, they ran. Uh, Katya, she, she made Aliyah some years ago from Ukraine. She, she ran with her husband to the safe room. Now, in the house, the safe room's here and then they've got a corridor and they've another safe room over the other side as well of the house and they have a spy hole in the safe room so she could see down to the other room and her son was in his in the study at the end next to the other safe room so she shouts to him get in the safe room it's terrorist so he locks himself in the safe room she and her husband lock herself in the safe room now the safe room if you're looking at it like this has a big fat handle on the outside so you can't miss it and it's got a spy hole in, and you can see, even though it's good seal, you can see that that's a door. And the terrorist came in, and she said, she was looking through the spy hole, and all the time she was praying to Yeshua, save us, save us, please don't let them see it, hide us, Lord, blind their eyes. And he stood there like that at the door, and his friend came in and he said, just a wall, no safe rooms, and went down the corridor. And then she started praying for her son, the same prayer. And he looked at, she could see through the spyglass because it, it went right down the hall. And he looked at the son's safe room, big handle on the outside, spy thing at the top. And he just looked at it like that and he said, no, no safe rooms in here, let's go. And off they went. You see, this is the God we serve. This is the God that we need to get to know intimately. And this is his spirit that can save us from anything. But we must do it his way.